she was a real estate lady and I was probably one of the last people to talk to her. I was a car salesman at the time and she was looking for a station wagon and uh, so I phoned her that night. You phoned her, please. What could possibly happen in 12 minutes? 31 year old real estate agent Irene Pearson was violently murdered while showing a home for sale. Block, I guess it was about the third week of July and Hazel uh, was one of the first ladies that welcomed me into the apartment block and she actually gave me a hug. Investigators are hoping that the public will be able to help police retrace the last few steps of Marston's life. Welcome to Lens, covering social media stories that matter. Les Landry of Medicine Hat Alberta has been prominently featured in the media for initiatives such as Respect the Service Dog, People Fighting Poverty, and recently his application for medical assistance in dying. However, Les has a problem. He has been the last man to speak to one murdered woman Irene Pearson, lived next door to another murdered woman Hazel Lloyd, and failed a polygraph in the murder of Tanya Marston. Retired Winnipeg Police Service Officer Andrew Mikolaevsky began looking into the case as a civilian. Here is Andrew on the True North True Crime podcast speaking to his interactions with Mr. Landry. This is only an excerpt and I strongly suggest you listen to this podcast in its entirety. Link is in the description. He contacted me uh, back on July 27th, uh, 2020. Um, and uh, he replied right away saying, first, who are you and why do you want me for that book? And I basically just said I, and he also was very curious why I had con contacted him through, and searched him on LinkedIn. Um, and without any solicitation, he like, replied, maybe you should do a story on Irene Pearson. I believe I was the second last person to talk with her before her murder. And I think I, the killer, worked with me at the car dealership. And those are the exact type words that I have here. So he volunteered the information that he became a suspect in the murder investigation. So the man admits to being one of the last people to see Irene. Now you may at first be confused by the I the killer text message. So were we. We asked Andrew to clarify this. Yeah, and it's not my broken English, yeah. it's, his it's his typing. Yeah. <laughs> he, uh, it was, uh, maybe do a story on Irene Pearson. I believe I was the second last person to talk with her before her murder. And I think I, the killer, worked with me at a car dealership. I mean, I, that got me right away too. So I had everything in bold here in front of me. And I have I, the killer, in red because it came out, well, <laughs> I drew, all my drew my attention to it. So what happened next was a series of text messages on LinkedIn in which Andrew built a rapport with the suspect. Well, we continued our texts. Um, I, I sent him a message back. Uh, Irene Persons, uh, these are my words now, Irene Persons murder would be a short story that unfortunately stretched over four decades. She went to my mother's church. Before my mother died, she asked me to look into it. You want to read Stoppel to get some background on me? So I, I let him know that I was interested in looking into, the, in, into Irene's murder and the reason why. And so I sent that message to him and... Uh, we subsequently kept on going back and forth. And he desperately wanted me to give him my, to, to phone him. But I didn't want to do that right away because I didn't want to interfere in the investigation. I just wanted to catch base with him to see where it was going to go. And it went a lot further. Um, I said I might get a hold of him. And at any rate, uh, let's see. I sent him a message trying to get his confidence and why he was interested in it. I said, in, in any murder case, three key pursuits should be pursued. Number one is a justice for the victim. Number two is closure for victim's family. And number three, making the truth public. And I, also, I, I said that I honestly don't think after 41 years that either number one or number two will ever be reached, which leaves us with just discovering the truth. I know you're interviewed in this case, as were others. I would like to review your recollection of events from the week of the murder, including three to dirt three to four days afterwards. Most importantly, I would like you to describe in detail every police encounter you went through. By eliminating everyone around the case, the true killer will appear. And uh, 
then I, I wanted to put him off a bit because I did not want to give him a phone call yet because, as I said, I only knew the tip of the iceberg. And if you're going to do any kind of investigation, especially a homicide, you have to know everything about the victim, you have to know everything about the crime, and you have to know everything about your suspect. And I didn't have much on any, all, any, any of those. On July 31st, I re- received another unsolicited message from, from this suspect. And he said, this murder may be worth looking into. So he sent me uh, Medicine Hat News uh, information uh, from the website, from a website, I guess. And it was regarding a murder of Hazel Lloyd in 1994. And he also sent me links to stories covering the murder from CBC, Medicine Hat News, YouTube, and the Calgary Herald. And he said that he is a suspect. So now I've got two murders that he says he was a suspect for. So while asking the man about the Irene Pearson case, he also admits to being questioned about the unsolved murder of Hazel Lloyd. But the story didn't end there. Apparently there was more the main suspect wanted to talk about. Then then the next incident happened. Um, I think this was on August the 5th. I sent him a message. I wanted to just ploy with him here a little bit, uh, saying that uh, I I really didn't want to talk about the the second murder he told me about because I didn't know anything about it. And I said, it doesn't appear to be much of a story. Elderly woman dies in a fire. Winnipeg has 26 murders now heading for another record. I just wanted to solicit a conversation with him. He says, okay. Uh, the, the issue he says he had, he says he had three strokes and it's tough for me to type because I wanted him to type the entire incident out for me so I didn't have, so I didn't have to talk to him. And I could de- decipher the information afterwards. But he claimed that he had three strokes and had a hard time writing. Uh, then on the next correspondence we had, I said, uh, oh... Yeah, I wanted to play with him a little bit more. It's so like I've got him telling me about two separate murders unsolicited. So I figured uh, on the 12th of August, I sent him another message. I said, okay, out of curiosity, are there any more murders you think I might be interested in? And he responded at 4.33 in the afternoon, LOL. I did do a polygraph for one in 1998 or 99. I can even, re- I can even remember who the victim was. I think that should have, I should have, I might have typed that wrong. I said, I can't even remember who the victim was. And I just replied to him, wow, if I had a polygraph relating to a murder, I'd remember the victim's name. And all he could say about what he recollected about it was the fact that they found the body of a young lady in the river in St. Charles. I don't even think they told me her name. Now, I did records on cold cases that year, and I believe that person would have been uh, a young uh, indigenous girl by the name of Tanya Marsden. So the man admits to being questioned in relation to not one, not two, but three different unsolved homicides in Canada. We asked Andrew what the odds were of an average Canadian being interviewed in relation to three different murders. Well, pretty slim. I mean, the, the last person I, I, I spoke with that um, had been interviewed for several different murders, actually committed those murders, and his name was Terry Arnold, and uh, he was the one who murdered Barbara Gale Stoffel back in 1981. The odds of being interviewed on a, three separate murders is incredibly outrageous. On January 14th, 2023, Mr. Landry was arrested by Medicine Hat Police Service on charges of kidnapping. Local community journalist Thomas Foger spoke to Mr. Landry regarding his current and past brushes with the law. Community TV has a history of drawing out predators and getting them talking with the buddy approach. Mr. Landry admits to driving the victim down a dead-end road and chillingly asks, What could happen in 12 minutes? Okay, and then Tom is the police. What could possibly happen in 12 minutes? I, I would some form of anxiety, anxiety, uh, meltdown. Mm-hmm. And you know, I was kind of joking when you know, she says, I don't know you. I said, no shit. I says, I don't know you either. Yeah, like you're joking around, but she might be having sort of a, a mental episode. Or... Yeah, and uh, she says, I'm not comfortable. I says, I'm starting to get uncomfortable too. She says, 
says, I want out. He says, okay, let me, let me, well, let me slow down the van here. Let me stop the van. And she got out just before it stopped. She closed the door. She did slam the door. She closed the door like a normal person. Now that road, I don't know if you know that road. Uh, it's almost like a division road between S and N. I think I know the one you're talking about. And it uh, ends a dead end road. It stops at the coolie. Mr. Landry flippantly admits to having seen missing woman Jennifer Kimberly Magnus at a local Tim Hortons and bizarrely suggests she perhaps went away to get treatment. You know, then, then you kind of go through your mind, did I see her anywhere, right? Yeah. And I don't know, I think she was hanging around the Tim Hortons or Maple there one time, you know, like it's, I mean, that seems to be the new hangout. Yeah. You know, so, you know, but, you know, it's just that, uh, I mean, whatever happened to her, you know, or where she is, or she might be, maybe she's gone for treatment. You know, has anybody ever thought of that? You know, like maybe, she, maybe, she, maybe she's with somebody who's trying to help her. Tom's appeal to Mr. Landry's vulnerable narcissism leads to some very telling distancing and micro-confession language about Irene Pearson. Mr. Landry claims he met her via selling a car and she invites him out soon after where she admits to shady dealings with drug money. This chain of events seems highly unusual. It happened in 1979. She was a real estate lady and I was probably one of the last people to talk to her. I was a car salesman at the time and she was looking for a station wagon and uh, so I phoned her that night, and I says, this wagon came in, and uh, you know, I could bring it down and show it to you. And she said to me, she, what she, the words that she said to me, the last words she said to me kind of haunt me to this day. She didn't say, oh, last what we can do this tomorrow. What she said to me was, Les, that wouldn't be a good idea right now. And, you know, and when I hung up the phone, it was just like the hairs on the, the back of my neck stood up. Now, a week before she got killed, um, I was at her boyfriend's place, Kenny's Fear Kennels. I used to be a manager there. And like I hardly ever, I, I mean, I was a 22 or 23 year old kid. And here she was, I think she was 30 or 31. To me, she's a, right, you know what I mean? I'm a kid. Mm. Yep. And she would, she says, Les, can you come with me? I've got to take, got to take Lexi back to the kennel. To why? Can you want to come with me? I thought, well, that's kind of weird. And so, so yeah, so as we're walking across the back, across the, the yard, she says to me, Les, I don't know what to do. I said, well, what do you mean? She says, well, I lent Bruce, Bruce Curry, and Lawrence, her boyfriend, Lawrence, and I took $30,000. A lot of money in today, never mind 1979. She says, yeah, I lent $30,000 to do a drug deal, and they're not giving me my money back. Serial killers often have unstable maternal relationships. This is Les describing his mother in his own words. When I got home, my mom asked me how the trip was, and I told her I was scared, and she interrupted and told me that there's nothing to be afraid of, that Eddie was a good guy. She then took my money and proceeded to feed her addiction with another new uncle. We made several trips that summer, and when I tried to tell someone what was happening, the words would never hit my lips. I lived with the terror of that summer all my life. I can tell you, my life took me to places no human ought to go, and very few people make it all alive. By the time I was 23 years old, I was on the skids in Winnipeg drinking Lysol. There's much talk about PTSD and how it impacts veterans and frontline workers. And there's never much talk about this wounded warrior, the six-year-old, hiding under the bed, afraid of the sexual predator or the one person expected to protect. If you have information on Hazel Lloyd or Jennifer Camelli Magnus, please call Medicine Hat Police Service at 403-529-8400. If you have information on Irene Pearson or Tanya Marsden, please call Winnipeg Police Service at 204-986-6313. We asked Andrew what the odds were of an average Canadian being interviewed in relation to three different murders. Well, pretty slim. 
I mean, the, the last person I, I, I spoke with that um, had been interviewed for several different murders actually committed those murders.